and welcome to another episode of Research Radio, a podcast of the Economic and Political Weekly. I am Johan, and today we have with us Sudarshan Kotai, who will be discussing his work on mental health in India. Sudarshan Kotai teaches at the Jindal School of Psychology and Counseling, OP Jindal Global University in Sonipat. Sudarshan Kotai, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Johan, for this uh, opportunity. Dr. Kotai, we recently heard about the National Crime Records Bureau report of 2021 on suicides, on which daily wage earners topped the list. The cause of the suicides that were listed were individual problems, but in your paper you point out that this betrays a lack of understanding of how the pandemic affected people and also the role of the state indifference as a factor in these suicides. Why do you feel that the state is complicit in these suicides? Okay, thank you for this uh, question. So when we uh, look at the pandemic crisis uh, that uh, took place in 2020, the Indian government brought back the privileged people from foreign countries, including China, which was the epicenter of the pandemic, by Air India flight and also free of cost. So it was oblivious of the uh, of the uh, uh, migrant workers who were spread across the country and they were given only four hours to get back home and it was impossible for them as the public transport systems including the trains were halted so this kind of disenfranchisement and discriminatory treatment of migrant workers that followed were profoundly influenced by the lack of data on migrant workers also so that lack of data on migration and migrant workers also points towards invisibilization of their existence. So prejudice and discrimination by the state can have far-reaching consequences, not only on health, but also mental health. And after all, existence of certain communities, as we have seen uh, in uh, many parts of the world, even in our neighborhood, like Rohingya crisis and the Sri Lankan situation, genocides in many parts of the world. So when the state denies equality and discriminates people, denying them basic human rights, the immense distress that follows and the consequences of such distress, including deaths by suicide, need to be understood within that socio-political context, not as a personal mental health tragedy to be cured with the aid of mental health professionals. So when both the NCRB report and the state mental health discourse deny structural violence as a reason for deaths by suicides of migra- migrant workers, daily wage laborers, the state and mental health systems are complicit in depoliticizing systemic problems as mental health problems to be treated individually with counseling and psychopharmaceuticals. So we don't see any reference to state violence in the discourses on mental health during the pandemic crisis by state-run mental health institutions, which also hold uh, immense power in driving the mental health discourse. We Mm -hmm. know from very many uh, sources, like India fares very badly in most of the socioeconomic indicators. If you look at the global hunger index, gender index, um, uh, equality index, India fares very badly. So, uh, but we don't see uh, discourses in mental health referring to the uh, uh, the very bad socioeconomic situations, which are the social determinants of health and mental health. We saw the elitist uh, National Institute of Mental Health and Neuroscience Bangalore videos posted on YouTube for mental health awareness, which almost always portray pan- pandemic distress as a mental health issue when it is a social justice and also a human rights issue for most of the citizens of the country including the uh, migrant workers and other marginalized sections. So the result is that the individualized mental health interventions are put into practice, such as medicines, counseling, yoga, meditation, to address the human rights and social justice issues, which only uh, helps in sugarcoating the problem or ameliorating the problem, which in effect is not addressing the upstream causal factors, Mm -hmm. then uh, what happens is that it is uh, still beyond the purview of redressal mechanisms. 
so the mental health interventions uh, depoliticize the uh, structural violence and foreground a mental health narrative so the person in question also loses the agency to act against such uh, violence and violations so this in turn increases the diagnosis and number of patients creating unnecessary load on the mental health system denying care to people who really deserve mental health care so it is not a new phenomena a phenomenon um, we have uh, we know uh, that uh, if we re- if we read the history of psychiatry and psychology and mental health uh, disciplines we know that history is replete with instances of psychiatry and psychology acting as agents of the state in reframing socio political problems as mental health problems i i uh, see that this is nothing but a repetition of that history and i mm-hmm. think we need to be very uh, uh, cautious about uh, this and we need to have more conversations around that so in mainstream mental health curriculum and training we are ne- never allowed to think critically as we are trained to follow algorithms and assumptions that make us feel as if these disciplines are very scientific objective and value neutral i think that need to change and then only we will be able to uh, bring up uh, questions which are uh, not addressed and uh, the questions that address the assumptions you know that because it starts with assumption but we don't ask questions uh, about those assumptions and we continue the status quo as a student of sociology i find these links that you make between something as personal as suicide to a larger social context very interesting because ever since durkheim we have been taught to think of suicide as more than just a personal issue what is your understanding of this link between the individual migrant worker and their social context and how has that contributed to the high number of suicides among migrant workers so very pertinent question about the interface between psychiatry psychology and other social science disciplines like sociology even though i was trained as a clinical psychologist and i did my graduation undergraduation and undergraduate and post graduation in psychology i was never introduced to scholars in anthropology sociology and other social science disciplines who have contributed a lot to understanding mental health so um, i remember studying theories of suicide in my mphil in clinical psychology as a central government run mental health care institution where mm-hmm. darkheim's theory was not at all mentioned in the syllabus mm-hmm. so if you look at the new uh, revised mphil clinical psychology course mm-hmm. uh, by rehabilitation council of india suicide is uh, mentioned under the topic neurobiology of mental disorders and psychological theories of suicide mm-hmm. in our class the uh, the uh, the darkheim's theory was discussed as a footnote and we are made to forget it as neurobiological theories of depression and uh, no, suicide mm-hmm. biological theories are for front staged as psychology mm-hmm. and psychiatry both wish to stay in the camp of science and medicine and also foreground themselves as scientific and objective so they are very hesitant to take up uh, uh, issues which relate to society culture uh, which are more uh, related to uh, lived experiences etc so one philosopher of psychiatry talks about the creation of neurochemical self by modern mental health discourses where we are made to think about ourselves in terms of neurochemical imbalances foreclosing opportunities to be sensitive about power imbalances that operate in people's life worlds which are responsible for most of the mental health issues the united nations rapporteur on uh, right to health and mental health in uh, in the uh, position from 2014 to 2019 and he happened to be a psychiatrist for the first time he um, had uh, foregrounded the uh, issue that the mental health disciplines have often um, dismissed the power imbalance and always used to foreground chemical imbalance even though uh, power imbalance is the major driving force in the uh, majority world leading to mental health uh, problems mm-hmm. so uh, the migrant workers are uh, marginalized due to their social location which is often at the intersection 
between classism and casteism breeding the cycle of unemployment and poverty uh, when i talk to some of the migration scholars uh, they pointed out that most of the migrant workers are uh, are referred to as second shudras in their literature as they primarily migrate to other states due to denial of opportunities due to caste discrimination at their net, native place mm -hmm. we saw police uh, humiliating migrant workers in public by spraying disinfectants during the uh, mm -hmm. pandemic crisis so what kind of effect does that create in people who are already beset by a host of other difficulties so decontextualization of suffering leads to objectification and commodification which was evidenced when tertiary mental health care institutions under the government of india like logopriya gobinath bardeloy region institute of mental health at tespur central institute of psychiatry at ranji and national institute of mental health and neuroscience in bangalore were asked by the central government to provide counseling and psychopharmaceuticals to the two stranded migrant workers when the migrant workers crisis were highlighted by media across the globe mm -hmm. so death by suicides are often talked about by mental health professionals as individual mental health issues and this discourse prevents us from imagining interventions that focus on transformatory public policies which address upstream factors of suicide for this to happen mental health systems need to break their silos to collaborate with other social sciences and people with lived experiences to understand suffering and trauma in their context and in a better sense otherwise we uh, will continue this violence where people who are already beset with difficulties are labeled with another diagnosis and they are uh, 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 not given agency their agency is taken away to question and to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to bring up a solidarity in acting against those forces which oppress them yes i find this very interesting uh, dr kota because i remember in your paper also when you when you provide a critique of the existing mental health system you say that and i quote mental health discourses deny a social materialist understanding of distress and so these discourses end up reinforcing modern consumer capitalism could you speak about this a bit more okay thanks um, uh, so if you pay attention to any uh public interfaces of mainstream state run mental health institutions like nimhans or websites like this is a major public interface now or the mm -hmm. pamphlets which are issued um, the circulating messages on the uh, websites of these institutions you will not find any reference to casteism sexism heterosexism classism or state violence as a, as a determinant of mental health and the need to target those upstream factors so what this indicates is that even though uh, mental health disciplines uh, would uh, refer to social theories and political theories or you uh, know uh, the um, psychosocial understandings of distress and uh, it must have been discussed in the uh, classrooms or in the syllabus it never comes to the foreground it is never Uh, uh, seen as a dominant discourse the dominant discourse is always the medical discourse so if you look at the nimhans website itself it's national institute of mental health and neurosciences every page the transitional feature is the eeg wave so it creates an impression a visual impression that mental health is ultimately a medical issue so uh, we we can even see that the mental health training and curriculum also shuns these aspects which are very crucial in indian context because we import a western model of mental health which is ultimately devoid of any indian uh, social context and it doesn't speak about us in that discourse so a scholar uh, uh, poignantly stated that 
psychology in india talks to us without us so we are not there in the discourse and we read books and textbooks written by people from the west and we import that model and apply it without even being self critical about whether this applies to us are we aware about the different cultural understandings about mind mental health philosophy of mind philosophy philosophies of uh, suffering how do we understand distress nothing comes to even i have never been exposed to such varied understandings which is present even within india in different places different mm-hmm. uh, uh, contexts so the silence of mental health systems regarding the complex social realities amounts to violence and denial of natural justice so in doing so mental health systems reframe socio political problems as mental health problems to be treated with individualized counseling services and psychopharmaceuticals mm-hmm. this benefits the mental health industry that seeks to create more patients out of suffering patients mm-hmm. uh, in um, courts the result is that antidepressants anxiolytics and counseling are thrown at people for even the daily hassles which are mostly natural reactions to difficult circumstances mm-hmm. so the victims are diagnosed with mental disorders and the perpetrators of distress are never on the diagnostic radar so the state is never diagnosed as mm-hmm. responsible for mental health issues but the victims of state violence the migrant workers are given labels of depression anxiety given psychopharmaceuticals counseling services etc mm-hmm. so this leads to proliferation of patients increased visibility of the mental health profession which itself which uh, the, which itself uh, suffers from identity crisis of whether i need to be in the medical space or in the social space because psychiatry and psychology cannot be completely medical because it also looks at people who are living in a society in a culture so there is lot of conversations around the identity crisis of these two disciplines so it leads to profit making by mental health uh professionals when uh, uh people who are suffering out of uh, social or structural issues are reframed as uh, patients who need uh, mental health services so it was only last year that american psychiatric association and american psychological association tendered public apologies for instituting racism in mental health research and practice even though delayed apology is an ethical act which has implications for public health ethics mm-hmm. but if we look at the indian uh, scenario indian psychiatric establishments or psychological psychology associations have never tendered apologies for even conversion therapy which were, which is employed against lgbtqia plus people mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, which was recently banned by the madras high court but the uh, effort to, to ban such a practice did not come from within the mental health discipline so that itself shows the uh, lack of uh, attention to value based or ethical uh, psychiatry or ethical practice of uh, psychiatry and medicine so this we see even in the case of healthcare because in mbbs also the scholars and uh, the uh, the uh, medical council of india now uh, the national medical council uh, realized the need to have separate training uh, curriculum for ethics and communication only in 2019 because they understood they realized that it is affecting the way uh, doctors practice on the ground because it 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 came out of the experiences uh, of an uh, unethical practice and how can we uh improve the uh, the way in which uh, doctors um uh, relate with people relate with diverse people relate with people coming from different cultural backgrounds uh, and mostly uh, from a very marginalized uh, backgrounds too particularly when they practice in a setting like india uh, which has a lot of inequalities uh, inequities poverty uh, gender discrimination a uh, caste system all kinds of complex uh, social realities which uh, ultimately impact health uh, and mental health even life itself thank you dr kotai uh, i think this is a thing that you were talking about right now which you also hinted at earlier and which is an interesting section in your paper about the politics of psychiatry right in your paper you also mentioned two examples 
that I would like to discuss a bit further. Right, one is about the branding of tribals in Kerala as mentally ill, and the second is about how the state and the discipline of psychiatry work together to frame non-heteronormative people as mentally ill. Okay, thank you, Johan, for referring to those uh, uh, articles. So the uh, first reference to Kerala. Uh, is with regard to the field work which I conducted for my research on community mental health programs run by NGOs as well as government organizations in the state of Kerala. Mm -hmm. In the name of scaling up mental health services, increasing access to mental health services, the community mental health programs had reached out to the tribal population living in Vayana district, which mm -hmm. also includes many particularly vulnerable tribal groups. The psychiatric social worker used to prescribe medicines for the poor tribal people, which in itself is a violation of basic medical safety laws in the country. Only a medical uh, uh, professional with a basic medical degree is supposed to prescribe medicines. So this was even flouted in the case of the uh, tribal population. The psychiatric social worker used to imposter as the imposter of the psychiatrist hiding the original identity that is of the psychiatric social worker who has a nemphil in psychiatric social work so the tribal population um, um they don't uh, know uh, the difference between a psychiatric social worker and the doctor so they used to assume that this is a doctor who is coming to mm -hmm. uh, treat them because the psychiatric social worker also comes in the uh, vehicle provided by the government because the government has provided all the facilities for the NGO to conduct this service except the the doctor so uh, except the medical service or the psychiatric service mm -hmm. so I found that the lived experiences of the tribal people were sidelined to pave way for a technocratic biomedical psychiatry that seeks to only elicit symptoms of disease quote unquote even though the tribal population foregrounded issues like hunger misappropriation of their agricultural lands by powerful neighbors unemployment sexual exploitation etc as reasons for their distress the response of the community mental health program was largely focused on providing medicines, dispensing medicines, documenting them, and to ensure its com compliance. So any difference or deviation from the normal quote-unquote behavior was seen as a psychiatric problem as the diagnostic al algorithm is overstated over people's stories. Mm -hmm. This points to a lack of tolerance of diversities and differences by mental health professionals due to insensitivity to local context and diverse ways of being in the world. So I would also say that I will not blame all of them because many people do that um, uh, thinking that this is the right way to do because we are not trained to appreciate diversities and differences and mm -hmm. also look at uh, suffering in mm, through many lenses. And there are also people who do that to uh, to portray themselves as scientific and you no know, as uh, very objective and to you no know, commercialize uh, the services so both mm -hmm. can be seen this in, this ha this is applicable to the biomedical or the health services also so this in turn can be traced back to reductionistic ways in which mental health is imagined in mainstream mental health settings for example when i was trained as a clinical psychologist as i mentioned earlier mm -hmm. Such uh, critical understandings about mental health or alternative paradigms within mental health were never uh, uh, seen in the curricula. Nobody discussed it. So even if we ask uh, certain critical questions, it was shunned and we were asked to follow the manual and to follow the algorithm which is provided in the manual. So it was a very mechanistic way of understanding. So many psychiatrists also call uh, psychiatric practice as a vending machine kind of practice or a machine kind of a practice where there is a stimulus, there is a response. So we don't, we are not trained to understand people from their context, understand mm -hmm. their uh, ecology of suffering, you know, ecology of mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, with respect to your second question, sub-question, uh, with regard to LGBTQIA plus issues, 
the mental health systems were silent until the judiciary stepped in uh, with regard to lgbtqia plus issues it was in 2008 9 if i am uh, correct the delhi high court decriminalized homosexuality and ipc 377 was decriminalized so we see that neither the professional organizations of clinical psychologists nor the psychiatrists uh, namely the indian association of clinical psychologists and the indian psychiatric society uh, nor the flagship journals of uh, psychiatrists and psychologists namely the indian psychiatric indian journal of psychiatry and indian journal of clinical psychology discussed mm -hmm. homosexuality from a rights based perspective until the delhi high court judgment 2009 so after which we see so many contradictory statements and editorial supporting uh, the uh, human rights of lgbtqia plus but uh, before that we find only pathological uh, representation of uh, 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 lgbtqia plus people in 2018 a day before the supreme court of india commenced hearing the curate petition on section 377 which finally decriminalized the ipc 377 the indian psychiatric society issued an official statement that homosexuality is not a mental pathology it was too late and uh, many uh, scholars in law and other disciplines had uh for seen that the supreme court will actually decriminalize it because it was uh, in 2014 that uh, the transgender people were accorded constitutional recognition and in 2017 the putter swami judgment right to privacy also touched up on sexuality as as a, uh, as a fundamental right and even the another judgment on uh, on shafin jahan case in 2019 uh, from the state of kerala uh, which came to the supreme court also accorded a right to choose one's partner a fundamental right by the supreme court so in uh, 2000 uh, if you look at uh, the contradictory statements and this fractured narratives which i mm -hmm. like to call it the in 2014 when the supreme court had recriminalized homosexuality the then indian psychiatric society president had termed it as a pathology requiring treatment so we see how you know the mental health disciplines voice for human rights protection of the marginalized sections uh, has been akin to whispering sweet nothings in tune with the juridico penal system so when the state says it is illegal mental health disciplines say it is pathological so there is no countering the uh, no the state power so there is no questioning of the um, the the powerful majoritarian discourse by the mental health systems we expect an ethical and value laden psychiatry psychology to offer public empathy and support transformative change instead of doing that practices like conversion therapy were given a free rein by mental health professionals and mm -hmm. the mental health systems like indian psychiatric society indian association of clinical psychology national medical council even after the supreme court judgment in 2018 which asked to do so and we expect the uh, mental health professionals to appraise the lived experiences of people from marginalized sections to the other stakeholders including the the supreme court and other you know juridical uh, or other state mechanisms but it is an intellectual embarrassment for the whole psychiatric and psychology uh, psychology community when the supreme court instructed the mental health professional to be extremely sensitive to the uh, lived experiences of lgbt people and to take extra care you know to institute social change also as treatment modality so it came from the from top down rather than bottom up so this is not only with um, Uh, with respect to indian context so we have scholars like sandosh pillai who is a clinical psychologist at nelson mandela school of medicine in 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 durban south africa who has also for, uh, also found a similar um, uh, a similar uh, uh, instances in the south african context where psychology and psychiatry were um, uh, silent about the uh, invisibilization of marginalized communities during apartheid and after apartheid how that changed because many psych many critical voices uh, started appearing mm -hmm.
So the Medra, we know that uh, it was conversion therapy um, uh, was uh, banned uh, recently by the Madras High Court in 2021, and it instructed the NMC, National Medical Council, to frame guidelines regarding the same. So it was only after the Madras High Court banned this practice, the National Medical Council recently named it as a misconduct. It will be seen as a medical misconduct uh, if practiced on the lines of Madras High Court judgment. So what we see, what uh, if we look at all these instances, all these boil down to the fact that mental health disciplines fails, failed to act as liberal leaders in speaking about LGBTQ issue as a human rights issue and a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other, but at the same time, we see many lived experiences, uh, uh, scholars from law, from social sciences, sociology, anthropology, creating a lot of uh, uh, discourses around the same issue through, through their um, engagements with mm -hmm. the population from a rights-based perspective. So instead, mm -hmm. LGBTQ people were pathologized and put to harsh treatments, including conversion therapy, and electroshock uh, therapy. Uh, yeah. Even I have seen in my field work where a person who identified as gay was treated as a, as a person with schizophrenia for around 10 mm -hmm. years without regard to the violence inherent in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in these practices. And a vending machine kind of psychiatry which fails to listen to stories in its quest to claim value neutrality and scientificity does more harm than good so that we can see in the case of kerala and also in the case of lgbtq issue value neutrality that comes along with scientific thinking is detrimental to disciplines like psychology and psychiatry which deal with mind which requires deeper engagement and cross-disciplinary collaborations you described for example the power play between different stakeholders and mental health institutions and uh, that you worked in. So how do these reflections of the social structures within the mental health care system affect the understanding of the treatment of mental illness? So mental health institutions, as far as I have understood, are ultimately social spaces which reflect the very society in which we all live in. So they are no way different from any other uh, no, uh, public space or an academic institution, so to speak. So I would say there is a huge gap between what we expect out of a mental health professional or a mental health institution and what we see on the ground uh, no? mm -hmm. uh, in these uh, spaces. So mental health professionals are supposed to be more empathetic, understanding and compassionate as compared to other disciplines. That is what we expect because they are trained to do that. But these spaces, as far as, as far as my experience is concerned, fails to meet those expectations. And these spaces are very much elitist with upper class, upper caste dominance and very cis heteronormative in nature as any other academic institution. So we see uh, like Tata Institute of Social Sciences uh, was the first uh, institution to have a gender neutral hostel. The National University of Law in Hyderabad was the first university in India to offer a gender neutral degree where the students had the freedom to have a prefix of MX or a Mr. or Miss. And the IITs like IIT Bombay was the first uh, uh, institution to have an LGBT support club way back in the 1990s. We don't see such uh, any such forward looking mechanisms in place in any of these mental health institutions and if uh, we read the narratives of medical students and uh, from most of the uh, literature also shows the same trend that medical institutions are very uh, much hesitant to uh, delve into uh, conversations around uh, no, uh, politics and you know, the society, the culture, because it creates a kind of uh, um, identity crisis. Uh, for them, so it's a very, a very, a very limiting space as far as the literature and uh, literature is concerned. So we see, I saw that all do the same thing in in mental health institutions, which are ultimately, which ultimately comes under the rubric of 
medical and medical establishments so nimhans mm-hmm. comes under the ministry of health and family welfare mm-hmm. and ultimately it's a medical college where non medical professionals are also trained like medic medical clinical psychology psychiatry social worker mm-hmm. it's a very it's a minority group compared to other uh, medical disciplines like psychiatry neurology neurosurgery neurophysiology all such uh, medical uh, disciplines Uh, even though the discourse is about uh, the uh, collaboration which is required and the health team as we call uh, mm-hmm. during our course like psychiatrists psych- clinical psychologists psych- psychiatrists social workers psychiatric nurses all need to work together but there is a strict hierarchy in which direction flows so when i was working as a clinical psychologist in a uh, mental health institution run by the government mm-hmm. i used to get mm-hmm. referrals from psychiatrist asking me what psychological test or therapy i need to do which is an overreach on my autonomy as a independent mm-hmm. uh, mental health uh, professional so i used to get uh, referrals asking me to do rorschach test uh, thematic perception test do cognitive behavior therapy so we don't we cannot expect a pediatrician a surgeon sending a referral to uh, another medical specialist asking him to uh, prescribe this medicine that medicine no, it is not expected it is under the purview of the surgeon to decide what he or she or they ha- no they have to do uh, with respect to that face that that patient so even the seating arrangement in the seminar hall that we had in uh, in my training institution had the psychiatrist seating in the sitting in the front followed by the C- the psych- clinical psychology then the psychiatrist social workers and the at then at, at last the nurses in the rear end reflecting the hierarchy and the skewness of power no? among these uh, professionals so the skewness can happen between non medical professionals and medical professionals sometimes the nurses and the doctors will be in on the other side um, as against the the psychologists and the psychiatry social workers on the other and also uh, uh, between the psychiatrist and the clinical psychologist between the psychiatric social workers and the clinical psychologists and the nurses and the uh, all these permutations and combination but always the psychiatrist also always um, is at the apex so we don't even see a non medical professional uh, uh, getting into the directorship of any mental health profession we will see only psychiatrists uh, being at the top so that it's all even though we have the disco that's a very interdisciplinary team working together on the ground again we don't see such uh, 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 no uh, uh, we don't see such uh, uh, practices which provide equal opportunities for all the uh, professionals involved in mental health care mm-hmm. so uh, if such power equations are at play within the mental health disciplines in a mental health institution we can imagine how much we can expect the mental health professionals to engage with other disciplines social science disciplines for example with anthropology or sociology so this hierarchy is displayed in the relationship between the patients and the clinicians also and mm-hmm. between the trainees and the supervisors also so i know many students many of my colleagues also who had to leave the course as they were humiliated by their own uh, teachers in these institutions mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so uh, uh, even i remember when i was in uh, in 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 uh, assam in in tezpur there used to be lot of uh, people who come with burqa and uh, long beard so the mental health professionals who came from assam and from the majority in community used to immediately uh, label these people as silati psychosomatic silati is a district neighboring district in bangladesh mm-hmm. uh, which who speak silati language so mm-hmm. the social political um, uh, context in which the clinician comes affects the uh, way in which they uh, uh, perceive the uh, the person on the other side so this affects you know uh, in, in the practice because it stigmatizes it diagnoses it misdiagnoses it over diagnoses without listening to their uh, stories so this uh, was uh, very much uh, seen and i had even seen caricatures of silati psychosomatic drawn by mental health professionals in the mm-hmm. clinical spaces of this center of excellence which which suggests the intellectual and emotional partition between assam and bangladesh because there is lot of 
political issues between these two uh, states uh, assam as a state in india and bangladesh pre partition post partition issues the infiltration by bangladeshi people and the recently this um, constitutional amendment uh, which uh, provided uh, uh, citizenship to uh, to certain religious segments and denying it to certain religious segments so this many majority assamese mental health professionals expressed this resentment and anger towards the minority patients frequently chewing the cud of uh, religious animosity so the uh, the this reading of indian psychiatrist and the bangladeshi migrant refugee relationship opens up articulations of the nexus between psychiatry and even international politics for the clinical mm-hmm. psychologists and psychiatrists Uh, these people were merely simple cases of silly psychosomatic who can be diagnosed and psychotherapized at the drop of a hat you know, reducing their identity reducing their stories to simple diagnoses and reducing their personhood their life experiences and trauma to a uh, symptom to be remedied or a cat- they are categorized as uh, diagnoses so mm-hmm. any i i always wondered because i used to because i was new to that place i came from the south and i had uh, i was curious to know about their you know uh, where abouts and their background so i used to uh, uh, initiate conversations with them but these were very unwelcome for the supervisors as it uh, represented me as a weak incapable uh, psychologist who is failing to diagnose people in the minimum possible time so this is the way in which uh, you know the, the 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 patient is foregrounded and the person is underrepresented and the suffering is um, uh, underrepresented whereas the diagnosis is given uh, more prominence and these diagnoses uh, are also not uh, scientific as we can deduce from this example because my understanding my my socio political climate influences the way in which i treat a people that is very interesting dr kotai you know but when talking about the critique of mental health care systems especially psychiatry i find that i'm i'm always a bit tense because of you know the national mental health survey is anything to go by there are many people in our country who could benefit from mental health care and uh, you know but as you've right rightly pointed out the underlying social injustices also need to be simultaneously addressed do you think that in india today there is some friction between these two approaches and how do we strike a balance such that we can address the broader systemic issues and at the same time ensure that those in need of medical care are still able to get it very insightful question indeed as a scholar in psychiatry puts it i quote people who need psychiatry don't get it and those who get it don't need it unquote so in a country like india we need mental health care which is locally sensitive experience near and culturally safe but the reality is that mental health training is very universalistic without giving room to talk back to popular truths which come as scientific evidence there is a friction as you uh, rightly pointed out between transformative change approaches and ameliorative approaches so ameliorative approach tries to segregate the person from their ecological context and provide individual solutions as we saw in the migrant workers crisis where the top tertiary mental health institutions were busy uh, providing counseling and medicines uh, psychopharmaceuticals to migrant workers uh, uh who were stranded due to state apathy and you know uh, the uh, consequences of an ill planned action a transformative approach that takes into account multiple causes and multiple solutions is far from the scene so there is a tension because if we uh, look at mental health also as a men- as a social justice issue as a gender justice issue as a sexual rights issue as a indigenous rights issue then we are also uh, expanding the horizon to look up uh, for multiple solutions and multiple solutions definitely will provide multiple um, multiple uh, uh, 
multiple understandings about an issue will provide multiple solutions to act on it so in mental health care we don't have that we have a very linear straightforward understanding because we have a dominant approach in mental health care which is reinforced by all the state sponsored mental health systems mm-hmm. so uh, we need to revamp our mental health curriculum i think it's the first step that respects uh, diverse viewpoints the curriculum that doesn't equate research with statistics so that we don't number the mind as another scholar puts it and instead provide opportunities for mental health professionals to undertake qualitative research which is experience near and very contextual so for example when i was studying we had a paper on research which was titled statistics and research methods mm-hmm. which was devoid of qualitative research completely so i never had my any exposure to qualitative research during my clinical psychology mphil which makes you eligible to practice as a clinical psychologist which may give you a license to practice as a clinical mm-hmm. psychologist mm-hmm. so uh, which is very strange because it's also the uh, the phenomenon where psychology tries to be in the camp of science they try to uh, you know uh, stay away from social science and they want to identify themselves within the faculty of science so you also must have seen where uh, most of the degrees in psychology were offered by faculty of arts ba psychology was in mm-hmm. operation but now we see most of the universities will be offering bsc in psychology and the courses offered by the faculty of science but there is nothing much of a difference except the statistics and physiology uh, uh, courses are added no uh, instead of two papers four papers are added so it it increases the load of neuro sciences and statistics in order to portray psychology as a uh, as a as a science or a clinical science and also clinical psychology always tries to stay closer to psychiatry and and also you know stay away from sociology which is seen as you no know, not uh, very uh, scientific and it's very subjective it doesn't you know it, it is more in the social so we see that you know more prestige and authority is with the medical and when we uh, move towards the social it becomes less prestigious mm-hmm. so um, so it's also important that we as mental health professionals get trained to realize that psychiatric way of understanding is only one way of understanding a person's experience and collaboration with people who are experiencing that suffering is also very important to decrease the skewness of power uh, between the cured and the curer the, the the psychologist and the patient so there is a huge uh, skewness of power so i talk the mental health professionals talk on behalf of the patient mm-hmm. uh, by silencing the voice of the patient so we need more voices from the migrant workers uh, uh, to uh, to understand what they actually need rather than having a top down approach where we decide the mental health professional decide the government decides what the migrant workers need which uh, completely sidelines their agency their voice and the humility to acknowledge the limitations of psychiatry and psychology so i think as i understand the first uh, is the first stepping stone to do um, psychiatry and psychology in a way uh, in which it doesn't Uh, do more harm than good for example i have seen during my field work when a woman who was suffering from domestic violence repeated assaults physical assaults by her husband she used to stay awake till 1 o'clock to wait for her husband to come and uh, she used to hear jackals and dogs barking at night and her house has no windows her house has no doors and she has to manage her whole home because the husband is alcoholic and he doesn't take care of anything and the, she has a teenaged girl who is living with her she has to wait for the for her husband till 1 o'clock to serve food for him she often told me that uh, the uh, the the, uh, the after the coming of the husband he even used to break the uh, pots in which you know the food has been made and after which physical assault used to ensue so she mm-hmm. comes to the mental health uh, 
institution due to the popular discourse that you know sleeplessness and all this have uh, you know uh, uh, treatments you can, then uh, the uh, she expects the uh, doctor to hear her problems and they mm-hmm. uh, she narrates that she has sleeplessness she is not having appetite she is feeling very tired she is not able to work she is being assaulted by the husband the response of the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist social worker was that don't quarrel back to the you know quarrel with the husband because it will lead to more problems you take medicines and you uh, come here every week uh, this medicine is free this is provided by the government you will be all right mm-hmm. in this uh, uh, example in this uh, uh, narrative we can understand how uh, her agency to act against the patriarchal violence that she experiences on a day to day basis which is also a legal a legal violence is completely reframed as a mental health issue the she now thinks that the problem is within her brain and she takes responsibility to uh, for her problem there is a mental health problem to be cured and she comes to the uh, the mental health establishment takes the free medicines and she goes so uh, when i so there was no home sit done there uh, what have is happening at her home nothing is uh, mm-hmm. is of concern mm-hmm. to the uh, the psychiatrist so when i visited her home i understood uh, her situation uh, of uh, living in a home without uh, doors without windows without um, uh, with with a girl child uh, with all these issues and once she is dubbed as a mental patient by the mental health institution now mm-hmm. the husband also uh, denies her um, narrative they she he says she is a she is mentally ill she goes to the hospital and this she is on medicine the neighbors now talk uh, of her as a mentally ill person completely denying her voice so mm-hmm. um, mental health systems have the power to silence the voice of the uh, uh, the marginalized sections and also act as a means of social control so the psychiatrists and psychologists are completely silent about the legal violence the patriarchy which is operating and the need to address it um, uh, as a systemic problem and there are lot of mechanisms in place you uh, know that they can collaborate but th- that was nothing being done and that too it's a community mental health program it's not a mm-hmm. tertiary or, or opd setting that i have seen this it is in a community mental health program if you read the national mental health program and the community district mental health program guidelines it says that mental health professional need to collaborate with the local community with the local uh, uh, panchayat or whatever urban local bodies to understand what is the context of suffering in that place they should have a cross uh, stakeholder collaboration but that is not uh, many scholars have pointed out the same that community mental health programs are um, are um, in effect just administrative psychiatry uh, there is no role sometimes i what i have seen in most of my field work uh, most of the cases there is no need for a mental health intervention there but mental health professionals unnecessary involve in every case even they talk about domestic well immediately there will be a medicine there will be a psychotherapy which is not required if that time is spared we can um, involve with people who really require uh, mental health services and quality care could be given with more quality time As my concluding question Dr Kota I'd like to ask about something that you mentioned what you call this rights based approach to mental health how do you see this translating into practice I find that mental health professionals need to travel outside the clinic to appreciate how the private troubles which are told and retold in the clinic are intimately intertwined with the world outside the clinic in the context in which they are living for example the woman's uh, the condition at her home so mental health professional need to speak about power and cannot remain a political value neutral a historical in a context like india where lot of inequalities exist in various forms so as evidences accumulate showing that social justice and relationships are main determinants of mental health experiences of multiple discrimination put people at higher risk for more mental health problems 
hence it becomes vital for mental health institutions and mental health systems to think where to intervene so for example as stephen uh, stephen pribe a psychiatrist reminds us that psychiatrist abstention from political involvement is a major mistake for the profession and for people with mental health problems so mm-hmm. growing acknowledgement of long term adverse effects of medicines focus on patient centered practice increasing concerns about the effects of polypharmacy so there is a psychiatrist from yale school of medicine who talks about deep prescribing uh, she has uh, been uh, uh, voicing concerns about increasing prescription of medicines and the need to deep prescribe uh, such counter narratives are um, there in uh, psychiatry and psychology but it is not in the mainstream we are not given opportunity to get access to those in our mainstream training so such counter narratives of uh, dis- medical discourses need to be acknowledged in the mainstream teaching training programs so that heterogeneity of psychiatry is regarded so we need a critical and self reflective mental health practice that challenges the assumptions in mental health mental health disciplines we need mm-hmm. to question the status quo which will help us to explore new possibilities and devise new solutions and i think uh, very importantly um, uh, human rights need to be invoked as an essential tool in the practice of mental health to enable mm-hmm. a reconstruction of people's sufferings by listening to those voices that are routinely dismissed so mm-hmm. i think this would also help us in bridging the vast gulf that has been built between academia and activism so there is a huge gap between academia and activism so that needs to be bridged and if need if it needs to be bridged we need to travel outside the clinic and if we need to travel outside the clinic we need to appreciate the social world at least we need to understand us as not only biological beings but also social beings not as patients but also as persons first then as patients that i think will help us to uh to institute a humanized psychiatry and psychology particularly in a country like india where we have a lot of difficulties in understanding different contexts in which people are living and most of the mental health professionals very important to note that most of the mental health professionals who are getting trained are also coming from different social location mostly from the privileged sections and is highly likely to dislodge the uh, experiences uh, with which they have no uh, access to so in an um, article which i read uh, uh, on cultural competency they said that when we try to implement it in pune a a, 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 a woman had come to the uh, clinic and the psychiatrist who comes from a very uh, urban background was listening to her experiences of caste discrimination so the psychiatrist asked i can't imagine uh, 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 that you being in a metropolitan city like pune experiences caste discrimination so the patient replies to the psychiatrist that please come with me doctor i will show you uh, how i experience caste how or how uh, many people in pune city experience mm-hmm. caste mm-hmm. so this uh, courage uh, to talk back or at least um, um, uh, 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 at least um, invite the doctor to the community in which he lives itself mm-hmm. is a progress that has been made due to the uh, psychiatrist uh, trying to understand that person in their context and also because the person is trying to understand how cultural competency can be applied in an indian setting this is a study which is being done in collaboration with people from uh, scholars from the uh, from from uh, other countries from the western mm-hmm. countries so uh, so that kind of relationship where the patient uh, what a quote and got uh, who is seen as a patient also has a say in what is being decided by the doctor and this cross pollination of ideas where the doctor or the psychiatrist or psychologist is humble enough to uh, to uh, to to tell the patient that i don't know you please let me understand your context mm-hmm. your suffering is uh, is the right step 
you know that builds that co-presence you know that that the presence of two people which is very very important in psychiatry in psycho because no technology no fmri scan is potent enough to replace co-presence thank you once again dr kotai thank you so much uh, for your patient listening and for this excellent opportunity thank you to our listeners for joining us and you can find the articles mentioned in today's episode in the show notes to experience all that epw has to offer head over to epw.in and subscribe today this is you on saying bye bye and see you next time on research radio <laughs>